speaking events in my life uh, before COVID-19. So <laughs> it, it's the life of what we're doing now. So I think we're all getting on board with it. So I think, oh, good. Now we are officially live. Yay. So <laughs> sorry, everybody. It takes us a few minutes to really uh, get everything up and going here. So um, welcome to what I've been calling coffee with Kathy. So I always tell everybody, I don't care what you have in your cup, but today I'm having iced tea in my cup. Uh, and uh, so I am Kathy Dion, I'm the Executive Director for the Autism Society of Maine. I'm also the parent of a 26 year old um, adult with autism. So, you know, I have that perspective that I like to add and, and, um, and I've been having guests. So if you'd like to introduce yourself to our audience, that would be great. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Carrie Magro. I am a professional speaker and author. I work very closely with the Autism Society of America on their panel of advisors. And uh, I have a very unique story. Uh, I was diagnosed with autism uh, when I was four years old in 1992. I was nonverbal for the first three years of my life. And doctors said I was on the severe end of the autism spectrum. I don't like current labels, but they said I was on the severe end of the autism spectrum. But after overcoming many of my obstacles today, I can say that I graduated with my doctorate. I have the full-time job as a self-employed speaker. And I get to work and wear many hats within the autism and disability community today, not only from the advocacy side as a grassroots advocate here in Hoboken, New Jersey, but also making sure that we're also uh, passing federal legislation. I also work as a consultant, bringing a realistic portrayal of entertainment projects to our entertainment industry in my spare time, along with having a nonprofit organization called KFM Making a Difference, where we provide scholarships for students with autism that go to college while also providing mentoring, coaching, and training for those with special needs as they transition to adulthood, which is why I'm really excited to be here for this coffee and chat and really talk a, a little bit about the adult topics that are facing our community right now with COVID-19. Yeah, and I, and this is an important segment, I think. And, and even, you know, for a lot of families, they don't quite understand how they can connect with their adult on the spectrum, whether it's through this Zooming, this, this you know, phone chatting. I know a lot of families would say to me that, you know, he only talks to me like for three seconds on the phone and, and it's very quick and short and blunt. And I was like, oh, you know, that's interesting because we are now in a, in a time where we're socially isolated and how are families communicating with their adults? And we do have, um, uh, a lot of individuals that uh, reside in those congregant settings that everybody talks about. And um, we just had a meeting yesterday where I heard a family saying that they hadn't been able to talk with their child, their adult child in over two months. And that just tore my heart out thinking, why aren't we having better ways that we can communicate? And where is the Zooming? Where is that? And yep. I think a lot of people are struggling around that. So I guess, why don't we just um, start with one of the questions that I had was, what do you think the hardest part has been for adults on the spectrum through this? This is like so difficult for so many of, of them. And I thought you'd give great perspective, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I mean, it's, as my friend Stephen Shore says, autism is very much a spectrum. So what I've been noticing in our autism community, one of the hardest things which I've been interacting with people in our community about is the unemployment rate. So many of our loved ones have been losing their jobs. I believe in the United States alone, we had over 20 million uh, people losing their jobs. And even though we're seeing a little bit of an uptick now, that was one of the hardest things I had to talk to many adults with autism about, simply because of the fact that also a lot of them uh, that I talked to have difficulties really with money management. And not only that, but understanding things like filing for unemployment, filing to get your stipend. Uh, that was something I had to do uh, because my full-time job is in public speaking. I had 26 events happening in April for World Autism Month, and all of them were postponed or canceled. So I had to go through this routine change, which was very, very challenging, along with so many of our families have had to face uh, and try to figure out what this quote unquote new normal is. So in a nutshell, I think the biggest obstacle that 
is really currently facing a lot of our adults is the employment issue, but then also PPE and also trying to find any type of funding at this time to keep them going because I mean the $600 unemployment is great, but I mean to really pay the bills, especially with how we're seeing I mean, we're, we saw 21 states get new cases of, of, of COVID, which we were just, Kathy, we were just talking about. So it's, it's really important that we're really money managing right now and looking at the employment topic as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we, when we are looking at um, individuals that are living independently, so they've had a job, they're living on their own, uh, and now they're working, they've had to go on unemployment. For a lot of them, their socialization was at their job. So now they, they've lost that. And, you know, it, it, it's so, to me, it would be so difficult when you have to go through that and, you know, you don't know what to do. They've never yeah. had to go through that. No, it, it, exactly like you said. And that, and that brings up a big topic that's also happening, mental health. There is, it, it kind of has fallen through the cracks, in my opinion, especially in the mainstream media. Everyone's talking about people's actual physical health but they don't understand the relationship between mental health and physical health. I, I, I've honestly been trying to steer away, honestly, from social distancing and instead calling it physical distancing because right now, none of us should feel like we're alone. Every one of us should be reaching out, connecting with them virtually as much as possible to keep our sanity at this time. Yeah. I keep getting a little bit of freezing. So sorry about that, everybody. Um, you know, you're right. And I think that, um, you know, they keep calling it social distancing. And when you think about that language, this is why I love talking to adults. <laughs> because you know, in our minds, we're going like, oh, yeah, we're social distancing. But you know, when you think about that, you're thinking, oh, you're telling people to socially be distant. And, um, and basically they need some sort of contact, whether it's gonna be on the phone, by video. Um, and you know, I think you can still meet people and stay 10 feet away or six feet away, however you wanna do if you're meeting in a park somewhere, if you're meeting, you know, even in a parking lot. <laughs> I have seen, and this is funny, but I have seen more people parked in their cars and just resting their arms on the hood and then they're talking to the person three cars <laughs> over. It's, it's kind of interesting, but it can be done. And I think we need to help um, adults understand that and, and guide them towards, it doesn't mean, cause you know, they're very rule-based. So does this come into play a little bit with uh, when they see these rules and then they change quickly? Absolutely. And I mean, one of the biggest challenges I still deal with uh, autism today is transitions. I've never been really great with transitions. Uh, then I found a job in public speaking, go figure. Uh, but anyways, uh, transitions are still a very, very big challenge that many of us face. And one of the things I was really talking to a lot of self-advocates about was really about finding that time management and finding that structure right now, being able to really think about everything from actually having three meals a day, two snacks a day, how to allot your time, whether it's two and a half hours to three hours in between time. So you're remembering to eat. That's still one of the biggest challenges I have today. It's sometimes forgetting to eat. <laughs> uh, I was just giving a workshop about that actually a few days ago. And these routines really, really, I mean, for some people, a social story can definitely help even for adults, but then also really just trying to talk to a supportive individual who understands a little bit more about what your schedule is and then structuring your new schedule at this time so at least if you have to go through this situation where you are staying home where you are unable to see your family that you still at least have a structure that could bring you to at least a little bit of a place of normalcy that's the big thing right now being able to structure a schedule that will work for you at this time, which includes social time as well, not being a workhorse at home. You know, one of the things that, um, and I'm a big, uh, I, I, I've always used um, schedules for my son. He, he started obviously with picture schedules as a young child. Uh, now that he's an adult, I still give him a schedule on, you know, what we're doing. And, and he has chores by a schedule. He checks them off when he does them. Um, and I think sometimes when we're 
thinking about us, our schedules have changed to go back to something as simple as putting something up that says eat lunch, you know, do this. And then because we, we, we do forget and time is, I, I don't even know if I can, how to say it, but time seems to be different when you're at home than when you're at work, you know, things flow and, and you have lunch and you have breaks and, and you know, when those are coming up, you got people around you, but when you're home, you lose track of time. So exactly. And time is so, so challenging right now because you could go through an entire day just like that because you're at home, you, you could be watching. And one of the hardest things I, I, I deal with as a mentor to young adults is making them go outside, making them go outdoors. And now during COVID-19, it, it's kind of gone back to, all right, I need to educate my, my mentees about not spending eight hours a day watching television and not playing Call of Duty on Xbox for five hours a day. Really having those time management skills in place so you could effectively, and because a lot of the kids I work with are also looking for employment. Some of them are in post-secondary and are trying to, were trying to figure out uh, virtual learning up till about the end of May. So uh, there, there's a lot of transitions a lot of us are having to go through right now and then then on the legislative end there's so much that still needs to be done from the uh, coronavirus response act to so much legislation to help our, our loved ones right now receive some form of supports especially from the family end and making sure that we're talking to our legislators about paid sick time for our loved ones who can support our young adults at this time as well yeah, it is an important factor. And I know that, um, and I'll just remind everybody that this is being recorded. So you'll get to see it later if you're not able to watch it now. And um, Tara's going to go ahead and throw up some links on um, Facebook just so that people will see different things. So if you mention something, she may be looking it up and then throwing it up on the, so people will see that. Uh, so I think, you know, when we're talking about uh, COVID-19 and we're talking about um maybe re-entry and and because people are already starting to think about that. I mean, a lot of us have not been here in Maine. We're on our third um, where the governor has put in orders. We're, we're not at the, I don't think we're still at the stay at, home, stay at home order anymore. And we're reopening slowly. There's still, she's reopening by counties. So there's 16 counties in Maine and there's four or three counties right now is, you know, Androscoggin, Cumberland, and York. Those are the heavy counties that have, we see a lot of the COVID in, and she's like limiting different counties can open. And, and um, some of them can open now. We were just seeing some of the um, gyms and the nail salons that were able to start opening, but only in 13 counties. So, so we have a, you know, a, a set of people that, you know, are really like, why can't we open all around? And they're not understanding the, you know, what she's trying to implement. How, how can we help adults understand that? Because think about that. If you're in one county, you yep. can't go to the gym. Let's say the gym is something you're a runner. You must, you know, like to do that. And, um, but you live in that county. What can they do? Should they go to another county or I, I guess I, cause they're rule based. And I'm thinking is, are they following the rules? Is that the rule? What's well, uh, and it's funny, Kathy, because we were just talking before the Facebook Live and the recording about the fact that uh, in, in, in my home state of New Jersey, I've only seen about 40 to 50 percent of individuals, and we just got rid of the stay at home order as well, wearing masks. And I think to myself during those times about how many individuals somebody would interact with during a specific day. And then I think about not only those with autism, but a wide range of developmental disabilities who have co-occurring conditions at this time, who we might not even be understanding really the impact that we might be making in these individuals' lives by simply trying to get out there and socialize with many people. There was just a statistic that was done via disabilityscoop.com that was talking about uh, the Journal of Health had just indicated that individuals with de developmental disabilities ha actually have a higher rate of death due to COVID-19 versus their non-disabled peers. And that just goes to show that we really need to continue to do social distancing, not only now 
but also looking at the fall because many experts are saying that we might hit a sec second wave of this. So when it comes to actual the county's opening and, and feeling a little bit down that your county might not be opening as fast as the others, really do realize that even though that that's definitely a difficult challenge, you should be focused right now on your key interests. Be focused on your goals that you have right now at home and realize, begin with the end in mind. We all are going to go back to some type of new normal eventually. We just need to stick it out right now and understand that this is not going to be forever. This is just a little blip of our lives that's going to be like this. Yeah, and I, I do look at that and I think about, you know, and I guess we're hearing, you know, the new normal um, yeah. and helping individuals understand what that's going to be. Are you working right now with um, individuals talking about any of these scenarios and having like groups? Are you doing it like by Zoom or? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of consultations via Zoom right now with many of my mentees, many adults, many uh, local legislators about grassroots movements as well. And one of the one of the things that I, I think it's important is that we all have these opportunities. I'm so grateful that a lot of tech gurus in our field have been offering, for example, Zoom has been offered to so many educators for free. Google Hangouts have been a tremendous, tremendous resource for engaging. One of the apps I've been recommending for a lot of my young mentees, it's an app called House Party. It's an iOS and Android app, which allows individuals to actually play games while they're interacting yeah. with each other, uh, such as the game Heads Up. Uh, such as uh, Apples to Apples. And all these fun games where it's not that that you have to like worry about like socializing for a certain amount of period of time. You could actually engage in fun and interactive ways while this is going on. Uh, in addition to that, I've been talking to a lot of my mentees about dating at this time as well, because that's a huge, huge issue, especially with how many dating apps are kind of being bombarded now simply because people are at home. They really can't go out on actual dates, in-person dates right now. And trying to talk to them a little bit about what that looks like at, at this time as well, so. Yeah, that's, I think that's interesting that the dating apps are, um, it is, I guess I never find it unusual that they target people when they really need to uh, beef up something so you see them coming out with oh check this out now you know that you're home you could do this and um is there something that we should um help adults understand that might be worrisome about some of that because i i think that that's also where predators can come into play and and i think that's some of the parents concerns too yeah well absolutely and that's something that you really need to keep an eye on, especially from the uh, perspective of giving away too much uh, private information online. That's the biggest thing. You never want to give away your last name online. You never want to give away your phone number when you're on one of these apps, when you're on any of the online dating sites. You really just want to keep it as casual as humanly possible, especially at the start. Obviously, once you establish a rapport, you can understand a little bit more and have a better understanding. But there are a lot of sketchy individuals out there, uh, even from my own personal experiences in the dating world as a single uh, male. Uh, so it's definitely something that we all have to keep our eyes out for. But you, you have to do it just like you would be before COVID happened. You, you need to make sure that you are taking precautions and not giving out too much information about yourself. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've been talking about is, and people don't want to hear that, but um, we've learned a lot during this. So if we do have a second wave, we, we have a foundation and um, the things that we've learned during that is something that we can expand upon. And I'm hoping that the, if, if we have a second wave, I'm hoping not, but if we do have a second wave and we see a lot of things going back into a, a shutdown, that we've developed some coping skills, we've developed some things at home. Do you tend to, um, when you meet with individuals, set up something of what they can do at home, how they can, can I know you mentioned the house potty, we did post that, so people will be aware of that one. Um, so I guess I'm just curious as how, what would your, your 
a session be with an adult who was working but is home and they're in their like mid 20s i know you probably need more information than that but you know well well absolutely so the first things we discuss is we do an assessment based on what some of their hobbies are what their interests are uh, just a one sheet really simple assessment just to get a little sense of who they are before we even go into really initial conversations with them via the phone or Zoom. Uh, and then we go into things such as what their daily day looks like from everything from when they're waking up in the morning, what time they're going to bed, and then breaking down what the day looks like. And the most important things we discuss are all the three online videos that are available for physical activity. Sumba has been one of the big ones. Peloton has been another one, even the, the bike service. You don't need a bike to go on the Peloton uh, website and get all these free services. There's a lot of groups that are doing that. A lot of gyms nationally are doing these types of YouTube videos and other forms of videos where you can actually get your 30 minutes of fun, engaging activity, which you can do at home, which has been tremendous. Uh, and then we talk a little bit about just what they're doing during the day in terms of social activity. And then what are they doing if they've lost their job or if they are working virtually and making sure that they try to do things such as taking breaks, taking a hour for lunch. So we break down basically the entire ex experience. And this is what I, I, I do for life coaching for individuals who are, are non-disabled as well. It's the same, same parameters. But with the, our, our individuals with autism, we really try to stress those transitions and making sure that there's even a, a, a more co coincident uh, structure. So. so if we had, um, I guess I'm just asking this general after talking with you for a little bit. So do you work outside of the perimeter of um, just like your home state? So if somebody from another state was interested in some of the services, you would do that? Yes. Family, yeah. Yeah, so uh, anyone who's interested can uh, learn a little bit more about me on my website at carrymagro.com. That's where I break down a little bit about my consultations, a little bit more about the books I've read and the films I've consulted on. And I also have a, a blog, which I post almost every other day on. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the great things that uh, I've been able to do is kind of what the Autism Society of America has done and uh, so many of the affiliate chapters is uh, to actually have COVID-19 resources. Yeah. I've written blogs on uh, five ways you can help a child with special needs during the COVID-19, my own personal experiences dealing with COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, and then also what can help adults as well. So if anyone goes to carrymagro.com slash blog, you can learn a little bit more about how you can contact me about consultation, but also more about the resources that I'm providing at this time. And also topics that are impacting our community. We've talked about everything from early intervention all the way to later adulthood and getting a diagnosis in adulthood. So a lot of topics there to look at. That's good. And, and Tara's, you know, put that up there on our um, Facebook live. So once, once all the links are there, then we make sure everybody gets all that in case they don't, they're not getting it on the webinar, but on the Facebook live. Um, but they are there for everybody to have, you know, and thank you for that. I, I you know, as part of the affiliate for, from national, the autism society, um, you know, they've developed their, their um, resources, which we tag into and we try to use and share we have developed our own family resource page during COVID. I don't know anybody who hasn't because it is so unique and everybody was like, how do I get this and how do I do that? Um, I also worked with, um, and I know you know, Dr. Jim Ball. And yep. um, I don't know if you know Christy Laughlin. Do you, are you familiar with her from the- um, Her name sounds familiar. Yeah. Indiana Resource, right? I think. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, they, they were guests on my show too. And, and from the very first show when we did it with them, they realized very quickly that families were asking, oh, my child's behaviors, you know, they've been home for two months. How are we going to integrate them back? And, and they developed a little workbook that has 10 steps to, you know, entering them back into either work or school. And they offered it for free for everybody. So, so that, I thought that was another great resource that's happening. So I'm, I love hearing the resources. And, and for me, having an, uh, you know, an adult who's living it, is, is really what we want to hear from because, you know, we always as parents can make guesses. I mean, my child um, is nonverbal, but he uses an iPad and he communicates, but it's still not the same as, you know, having a, a conversation. Um, 
And I always wonder, what is he thinking about right now? So sometimes you get the best information from just talking to somebody else who's living it too. Yeah. Anything, so, yeah. yeah I, I have a quote that I use often where I say, don't read a book to learn about autism, learn by getting to know people who have autism. And I think uh, when I first started public speaking about 70, seven years ago now, I realized uh, right away that I was like one of the only self-advocates speaking at many of the events I was going to. And that's why, that was a big push for my nonprofit. We started a video series called The Special Community where we highlight people impacted by a diagnosis. We do these 10 to 15 minute short interviews and we ask each one of the self-advocates, what would you like the world to know about you? In the hopes of not only breaking down barriers for special needs, but also helping nurture their self-advocacy. And we've actually highlighted several adults who have nonverbal autism. And they've provided such unique perspectives from individuals who've used augmented communication devices to individuals who uh, use sign language to individuals who are there with their parents who really just understood how they communicate in their own unique way. And it was tr it's been truly amazing to see while also kind of using that first person perspective and building on the neurodiversity in, in, in our community. Now, is those on your website for people to view or? Yes, so if you go to my Facebook page, Carrie's oh. Autism Journey, uh, all the videos, we have about 600 videos oh, wow. on there from uh, not, not only self-advocate interviews, but also uh, little uh, videos made by myself on, based on my journey on the autism spectrum. So. Everyone could check that out at Carrie's Autism Journey on Facebook. And then we're also on YouTube for those who don't have a Facebook account. And I, I, you know, that's one of the things I think that our agency, the society always looks at is when I sit on a lot of meetings, whether it's with the Department of Health and Human Services here in the state or whether it's Department of Education. But one of the things that we always try to drive home is when we're at these meetings is, um, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about services without a person who's utilizing that service. I can talk as a parent who has a child, great, but you really need to talk to somebody and have them at that table who's utilizing that service. So we're trying to drive that home more. And, and I think the state's, you know, trying to bring people to the table because it's, it's not fun to know that you have a service in front of you, but you haven't had any input in it. So do you see a lot of that in your state or... So my state has been pretty good in terms of building cohesion between uh, self-advocates and the entire community. Uh, New Jersey has the highest prevalence of autism in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's one in 21 now, uh, or one to 24. And it's so interesting because we've also had champions uh, from the grassroots level from uh, Representative Chris Smith to Bob Menendez, who both have, were pivotal in the Autism Cares Act uh, and its reauthorization. So uh, there, there have been a lot of conversations with them about how to really help make sure that disability uh, individuals have their voices uh, out there in the community. I wish that was everywhere. I, I still see a lot of mom and dad nonprofit organizations popping up every day and I, I don't see a lot of representation from self-advocates. And what we often say is it takes a village. And if we really truly want to see that village thrive, we need as many beautiful perspectives as we possibly can. So we're making sure that we're being inclusive to everyone. Yeah, it is. It's a big issue. And I think a lot of people don't understand. Uh, I guess one of the things is how to get, how to engage an individual when they're either um, at that table or, you know, people tend to talk around them and not with them. Does that make sense? I, I, that's how I feel sometimes. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it makes perfect sense. E even from my earliest days, I didn't start speaking in complete sentences till I was seven. And my parents realized right away that uh, speaking wasn't the goal, communication was the goal. Right. And when, when that really like hit them for the first time, it was like a deer in headlights moment, which they told me, it, it made it so much easier for them understanding that they need to really meet me where I was in my own development and just try to communicate with me versus at me. And, and that's when a lot of my, my communication was able to build uh, and now I'm uh, living one of my 
coolest dreams to again to travel the globe. Not right now, uh, but uh, hopefully in the nearby future. Actually, September, I'm going to St. Louis. So fingers crossed. <laughs> And, and everybody should realize, too, who's um, on listening, that um, Dr. Magro is our keynote speaker for our conference in the fall. So October 31st, we are keeping our fingers crossed as yeah, we watch you know, you the, the fall come and, and, and what it's going to look like. But we're very excited for that, too, because I think that's been another one of these in our state. Um, we you know we're, we're a quite a big state. and We're quite rural. So basically, we're going to be going to the Bengal region, which is an hour and a half from where I am right now. And um, they would really look at that as the middle of the state. <laughs> so there's still quite a ways up before you get to Canada. Uh, and um, it's it'll be exciting to have, you know, people coming for that conference and they get a sneak peek, really. Yes, I can't wait. Uh, I, literally the next a uh, couple of months are going to be interesting, but then we're going to get to the fall. We're going to get to hopefully get to see each other in person, and I can't wait. And for any self-advocate who's watching this, uh, one of the things we get to do at all of our events is, again, we, we do the interview series. So if you're interested in being part of that video series during the conference, please, please let me know the day of. We'll make sure we spend 10, 15 minutes and get the opportunity to share your story with the world. We have about 200,000 Facebook followers and we really hope to get to nurture your self-advocacy and also get your story out there to share what you want the world to know about you. So one of the things that you can do and I can help in that so we can maybe prepare people for that is send me if you can either point me to where I need to go and then we can take that and make sure we're advertising that you know, you're looking for this. And um, I, we didn't have a lot that came last year. I'm, I'm hoping to build that. That's what it really is. Last year, we did have a panel of individuals on the spectrum um, awesome. that was there. And, and I, every year I try to do something. I had individuals the year before on a panel and they really were talking about, um, was it work or school? I think I had them talking about where they were and how that worked out for them. And and they were on various levels, which is great too, because sometimes we can have a conversation, but it's a spectrum. So right, and, you absolutely. Them, and you need to look at the whole spectrum. And, and that's one of the things that we really look at from our agency is having everybody from you know one end to the other end. So it's, it's a nice thing. So Yeah, I, I think it's important also from the entertainment aspect as well. Uh, one of the fun things that I got to do was uh, work on a show last fall co called Mrs. Fletcher on HBO. Mm -hmm. And one of the characters on that show had uh, non-verbal autism uh, and had uh, severe, really se severely impaired, uh, five years old. And it, it was very unique because I, I, I kind of thought about my own personal experiences growing up. And one of the big things that came about from that was starting a lot larger conversation about highlighting nonverbal autism in our entertainment industry. We often get the Dr. Sean Murphy's of the world on The Good Doctor. We get the, uh, the Sam Gardner's on uh, Atypical. But Sheldon, you know, everybody talks yeah, about Sheldon, Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> but we don't get to see a lot of representation of the spectrum. We kind of get this. Yeah one aspect of it which is not necessarily what our, our community is so hopefully we get to break down barriers yeah i i'm hoping for that too and it, it is unique and all the conferences that i've been with with national i've always seen you know the spectrum you know you, you see them on on different areas and different levels which is what i liked and that's what I think we need to be a little bit more and um, be open and understanding that some people communicate differently, and um, and we need to be a little more patient. We're we're so uh, <laughs> we're so quick to talk and not wait for an answer too. So, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That's uh, one of my workshops next week is on uh, five ways you can help a nonverbal child with autism communicate. And one of the big things uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about is the importance of highlighting the fact that you should give a child a, a second before you respond. And the importance of that is that simply they might be trying to form sounds. They might be trying to form letters, words. And it, if we try to go straight to a new thing, it, it takes away sometimes from their development. So 
Uh, it's, it's a big, big topic of conversation in our autism community for sure. Do you ever remember, like, um, so you were nonverbal until seven, is that what you said? I, I didn't start speaking complete sentences until I was seven, and I was nonverbal until I was about three. Yeah. Do you remember that period from when you were limited in your language skills? Because I think sometimes, you know, it's, it's a, a, a time in your life where I'm sure there was frustration there where you know that you couldn't get that out or expel it or however, you know. Do you remember that time? Uh, very, very well. Uh, because at the same time I was going through that, I, I had uh, severe sensory integration dysfunction. So I didn't have the means of communicating with my family about the struggles I was having with all five senses. And I always was a city boy. I grew up in a big city. I live in a big city now. And having so much sensory stimuli, I was always uh, oversensitive. I was hypersensitive to all five senses. And let me tell you, not being able to communicate, and I, I hear this from so many families, not being able to communicate. I was a wanderer. I bolted every single chance I could because I couldn't simply communicate with my loved ones about the fact that I was dealing with these challenges. And that made growing up really, really tough. But uh, I, I often say during my videos, once I started speaking, you couldn't give me a stop speaking. It's great for having a career as a professional speaker. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I vividly remember most of, of those memories, especially when I was starting to really have severe uh, sensory issues at about three to four years old. Yeah, you know, I, I if for, as a parent who, you know, still has a child that is, is it considered nonverbal, but he communicates. And um, I remember having to watch him to see what he was gravitating towards, to see what he liked, if, what he was touching, you know, just to try to understand what he was going through, which, you know, looking back at that, it was like, and it was very beneficial because I think that's how we developed our relationship is we always let him lead and then we would follow his lead. Um, and you know, it, it's, it was difficult. And I think there's a lot of parents out there who sometimes give up on, on the, um, the language, uh, and we never gave, even to this day, I'm trying to get him to say words, he's 26, but he, one day he might just, you know, start saying full sentences or maybe he's going to start talking in French. I don't know. Uh, so yeah. So I think, you know, do you have any encouragement for families who might yeah. be in that Absolutely. Uh, well, one of the things I, I, I say is that uh, th there's an advocate we interviewed in our video series who didn't start speaking until he was about 18 years old, 17, 18 years old. And I, I just think about how so many of us talk about early intervention being the case, those first five years. But we have to realize a lot of the times when it comes to these therapies and it comes to these services, it's a marathon in, in some cases. So really just try to do your utmost, put your best foot forward all the time because so many of our loved ones, they are very observant. So when they see that you are putting your best step forward, that you are self-motivated to help them succeed, they will catch on to that. They will be able to understand that self-motivation and hopefully they'll be able to build it in themselves as they get older towards really trying to thrive during their therapies, reaching their developmental milestones and hopefully being able to fulfill their dreams and live the best quality of life possible. I've seen it from so many advocates in our community and as we continue to learn more about autism every single day and really learn more about the therapies that are really helping our loved ones thrive. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, incredible, incredible stories in our community. Yeah. And continuing I, in our community. Yeah. And I agree with that. And I, um, I have Cheryl who's, you know, joined us on our webinar, who was making a comment about um, even with nonverbal autism, there appear to be a wide range of abilities and communication and differences in all over functioning. Sometimes I feel those are non those with nonverbal autism are all thought to have intellectual disability and that has now been found not to be true. And, and we have seen this where people have, you know, wrote them off really and, and they're highly intelligent. We just have to communicate a little differently and, and, and you know, make that connection. Yeah, 
the, in the United States, the CDC indicates that uh, there's about uh, a, a fourth to a, a third of uh, our loved ones are nonverbal. But what they also indicate is that many of them have above to uh, or average to above uh, IQ. And that's so, so interesting because honestly, today I can say meeting the Carly Fleischmans of the world who, uh, Carly Fleischman, for those who, on the call who don't know, uh, wrote a Oh, we froze. <laughs> had a few difficulties in the past few years, but really lear learned how to communicate uh, via uh, augmented communication and was able to thrive. And uh, I consider her today one of the most brilliant people I've ever got to opportunity to know. And uh, it's it, it, it just goes to show that uh, I, a lot of people sometimes look at nonverbal autism and they think severely impaired. And I couldn't that couldn't be farther from the truth. Some of the people I know who have nonverbal autism are the smartest people I've ever met in my life. Can you get her name again? Because we'll post uh, either a book. She, did you say she wrote a book or? She did, yes. Uh, her name is Carly Fleischman. Uh, she wrote a book called Carly's Voice uh, and has had met much success in, in, uh, in, in her uh, life from uh, being a, she, she did a, uh, she wanted to be one of the first non-verbal uh, people with autism to ever uh, host their own TV show. And uh, she actually started a YouTube series. She had uh, Channing Tatum as one of her guests. Uh, she, she had another celebrity whose name I'm blanking on and uh, was actually on, uh, on uh, Stephen Colbert's uh, night show. Uh, to talk a little bit about uh, her, her show as well. So really, really cool individual to get to know. Yeah, well, we'll find her stuff in. Um, Tyra will post it for us. <laughs> uh, now, I know people are going to be asking me this, so I'm going to make sure and make sure and to ask you this is, uh, have you had any conversations with um, Temple? Temple Grandin. Uh, so I, I've had off and on conversations with Temple. I, five years ago, we were both keynoting a conference at Memphis University for the uh, Transformations Autism Center. And uh, I, I was the first day keynote, she was the second day keynote. And we got to talk and reminisce and talk a little bit about our journeys and all the great groups we've worked with, the Autism Society, affiliates of the world uh, included. And uh, it, she is just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, it, she gave me her phone number uh, maybe like two years ago and was like, if you ever need anything, text me. Just text me anytime. And, and, and I'm like, she's probably like the most well-known like autism advocate in the world. And she's like all nonchalant saying, oh, speaking 300 times a year, it's like, I don't know how you do it. I, I, I don't think she sleeps, to be perfectly yeah. honest, uh, but she's incredible. And you know, her it's, journey it's has been because, phenomenal. You know, I've been, I've been in the, with this agency, I've been here for 23 years. And um, I remember seeing her, you know, in one of my first, first or second year. And from how she spoke then to where she is now, it's phenomenal how she's just, you know, how she can handle the audience and how she handles those questions. And um, I've always said that I think my son is like her who thinks in pictures. And um, I related so much to her material with that. And, and I, I don't know if that was uh, helpful for us when we were uh, going through our journey with, with him. But yeah, I really found that that was uh, very beneficial. And she's, she's, very intriguing. So it, it is, most individuals that I meet, I find very fascinating and interesting. And um, it's like, you just don't want that conversation to end. I don't know if that's proper to say, but that's how I feel sometimes. I'm like, oh, I just want to keep talking. And, and it's not only about, um, it's their views, how they view things, like um, what's going on in the world right now, besides the COVID, you know, now we have the the protesters and it's interesting to hear from other people who have a different perspective and and I do like that a lot and I think that you offer a lot so 
Well, I, she, she especially from the perspectives of visual learners, the Department mm -hmm. of Education came out a few years ago saying that about 60% of students in the US are visual learners. And obviously we have the auditory learners, we have kinetic learners, but I found that so unique looking back at her book, Thinking in Pictures, being kind of just the first book I ever read from her, but then also getting to hear a little bit more of her experience at Colorado State University, everything that she's done from the HBO film to everything she's done with animals and now how animals are having such a great impact on so many of our loved ones in the community in terms of forming communication. It's been really unique and interesting to follow her journey uh, as, a, as a fellow speaker, but also as a, as a friend and as a fan of hers. Yeah, so I wanna get back to like one of the questions I had sent you, because I did send you questions just in case, you know, conversation sometimes doesn't flow as nicely, but I have never had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I wanted to ask about um, if we have to continue in quarantine, because I, I do think that we are seeing some states that are not fully opening. So their quarantine's now going beyond two months. Um, do you have suggestions how to maintain this for adults or, is it just stay the course? I, I, you know, I, I guess I don't know. Well, the, the important thing is one, have daily mental health check-ins check with a loved one. Uh, above all else, this is not the time to feel like you're alone and to feel like you're isolated. We need to remind ourselves constantly that even if they don't realize it, even if it's not a direct family member, there are people you could connect with. There is the Autism Society of America affiliate chapters. I post in about 20 different Facebook groups every single day. And I feel like I have a wealth of people who, if I'm saying I have a, for example, uh, a few days ago, then this goes back to my sensory issues. I was having a difficulty with, um, I had like a piece of food stuck in my teeth. And for me, that's like sensory nightmare for me. And it's like, I had no dental floss. It was late, all the stores were closed. And I'm like reaching out to everyone I know. And I'm thinking to myself, I need somebody to talk to about even the smallest thing like this, because it was so overwhelming to me from a sensory perspective. And within maybe like five minutes of posting about it, I received like maybe like three comments. And that, remind, that, that always reminds me that there are people who I can talk to. And that's something that I feel like a, a lot of us should be really striving for right now, just re remembering connections at this time, especially if this road is continuing virtually uh, with COVID-19, to remember that there are groups out there to connect with Facebook groups uh, like the Autism Society of Affiliate uh, Facebook groups. And then also to just keep following the Facebook pages, the Autism Society of America has been posting uh, along with the Autism Society of Maine regular uh, workshops via Facebook and Zoom and uh, have, have been providing databases. So even if you do feel like you're a little bit isolated right now, you, there's something new that you could potentially learn uh, out there in, in our community, so. Yeah. Um, Kendra's asking, uh, not Kendra, sorry, Cheryl. <laughs> Hi, Kendra, I do see you too. <laughs> so Cheryl's asking another question and I, I'm trying to understand, she's saying something about in one of your blogs, you compares himself and his strengths to temples. How are they different and how are they similar? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Kathy, could you say that one more time? I, I kind of lost you for a second. You know, I'm, I will hope I'm seeing this correctly too. So she's asking that in one of your blogs, you compare yourself and, and your strengths to temples. How are they different and how are they similar, your strengths and, and her strengths? Um, he is, is autism nonverbal, one finger typist. Oh, maybe that's can you clarify, Cheryl, um, if you're talking about, because you said one finger typist and the writer of two books. Is, is, were you doing that, Carrie? Were you a one finger typer? Oh, she's speaking of uh, Ido Kedar, who's okay. an incredible uh, autism advocate who's written, uh, I, I believe, several books. I, I know he's at least written one book. Uh, he is nonverbal. Uh, he, he um, yeah, I, 
I, I honestly don't know a lot about him. I know that I featured his blog, uh, which you actually mentioned, Ido and Autism Land, which turned yeah. into a book. I'm yeah. not really uh, too uh, familiar with him, uh, so I don't really know how they differ. I, I do know that he is a tremendous advocate for uh, nonverbal autism, though. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's good to get different perspectives. So having a, a name connected to somebody who um, is writing books or whatnot that is nonverbal, you know, and for me, the interesting piece would be is if you're reading a book of somebody who is nonverbal, reading a book who someone is very verbal and they both written them, would you know if you didn't know that person that they were nonverbal? And probably the answer is going to be no, you wouldn't. And that's a great thing for people, but they always identify with um, whether they they can speak or not speak and sensory issues comes into play a lot too. So um, so hopefully that answered your question, Cheryl. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to, we only have a few minutes left here on our, our coffee with Kathy here. And so let's say it's safe to go back to work or go back to school or go back to a program because many adults are also in these programs, they work and then they go to a program. Um, how can we help them so they understand the safety factor of when they go back? Because, you know, all these states are opening and they have their own guidelines from like wearing that mask. You know, you mentioned when you were talking with me about that. So I don't know if you have any suggestions around that for our families. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, obviously what the first thing you should do is you should go to the CDC website which have a list of safety precautions that are not only happening from a state level, so you can research what your state is currently asking to do in terms of also the safe at home orders to just normal safety precautions. What I usually say is that we should continue to re remain six feet apart, washing our hands for 20 minutes, and then also using that mask. The problem that I see, which is why we're introducing more social stories and visual schedules right now, is the sensory challenges that a lot of our loved ones are facing when they're actually wearing the masks. So when it comes to things like that, the importance of making sure that uh, there are several websites from the naturalautismresources.com website, they're actually providing sensory friendly masks at this time, which are made of cotton materials that are very soft in nature versus the protocol surgical mask, which can be a little grainy and have a, a little bit of texture issues. Um, so uh, it's, it's really important we, we follow those protocols right now for our loved ones. And as we get into the next few phases, uh, we continue to, again, remember the importance of clean, cleanliness and practicing uh, proper hygiene because that's something that all of us need to do with all of the conditions, because even thinking about two years ago, we had H1N1, and mm -hmm. that had a lot of serious ramifications, and the CDC, even though it was on a smaller scale, was advocating for the importance of daily hygiene and having a regular hygiene schedule. So make sure that you're really taking advantage of that. I think so many people are um, coming up with these unique methods of wearing masks these days. I, I kind of like to see the, the different people wearing masks. Matter of fact, we just we're putting out our newsletter that probably went out, I think it went out today to everybody and we send it out by uh, email. And the front cover, I did a little write up myself and, and it's a picture of my son and myself wearing our mask. So he's got a John Deere mask on and I have Star Wars. Um, so it's, it's interesting, but you know, even as sensory based as he is, um, we, we, I always say start small and go slow. So he's used to wearing it. Like if he has to go into where his work is, he puts it on, he walks into the business and then he goes to the room where he does his work and then he takes it off. Um, so we're doing, you know, things like that. He has not stepped foot into a store yet to go shopping. Um, and then he'll have, you know, have to wear the mask when we do that. And, um, but we're, we're getting him used to it now. We have him put it on and take it off and, and I think that's another, you know, sensory is high and some of them have those thin elastics, some of them at the wider ones. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, and, and what you said is so important. Taking it one step. Oh, you're breaking up a little bit here. That are out there on the market. 
Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no, uh, there are visual timers that are available on the market, which are really, really good for practicing this. Because uh, ideally, as we get back to a new normal, most of us are going to have to go, are, are going to go back outside. So practicing right now at home can be really, really important. Uh, if you go to a website called timetimer.com, they have these visual timers, which you can actually practice wearing a mask for five, 10 minutes at a time to build up your tolerance while you're at home. Uh, and it's a really, really good tool. It's actually a tool that my parents used when I was dealing with flu challenges growing up on the spectrum. Is it the one that the red bar goes as yeah, it's going? Yeah, yes, yeah. I love those. We use them in our summer camp too. So they, they are really good. So it gives you that visual that you, some people do need to have that. So, yes, um, absolutely. well, as we're getting close to our end here, I, I just want to again say that, you know, Dr. Mango is going to be joining us in uh, October on the 31st at our fall conference. So everybody keep your fingers crossed that we are good to go. He'll be the keynote speaker that morning. And you'll get to hear many more wonderful things. You're going to send me something where I can advertise and have individuals who want to have their story. Um, yes. I love that. I think that's so awesome. Um, and I just want to thank you for, you know, coming on today and talking with our families and myself. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Stay safe, everyone. And remember, you're not alone in this community. Remember, there are people out there that are trying to support so many in our community like yourself. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Talk soon.